Welcome back, everybody, uh, to the last session of the day. In fact, unfortunately, of the whole uh, conference today, uh, we have two uh, great presenters, Jordi Galli and uh, Yuri Gorotnichenko, who need no introduction, uh, who will take us to the, I would say, the, the core intersection between monetary policy making and the three factors that shape uh, the environments in uh, which monetary policy needs to be designed and uh, executed financial shocks, fiscal policy, and adjustments in uh, inflation expectations. So it's very, very topical, and very, very important um, papers. Jordi Galli will, uh, will go first um, with a really intriguing paper. And I'm saying that because, um, well, the, the title is Monetary Policy and Endogenous Financial Crisis. I'm saying it's very int intriguing, very fascinating, in fact, because it seems to challenge uh, what many of us and many people in general uh, view as the uh, received truth no, on, uh, on monetary policy making, that is that monetary policy would do best uh, concentrating on uh, its uh, macroeconomic uh, objectives and uh, in setting policy, and uh, rather than, say, setting policy with a view to dampening uh, boom and bust in, uh, in financial, in financial uh, markets because uh, that might cause uh, inefficient macroeconomic fluctuation. So the paper has, a, has an opposite, opposite results, at least in my reading, and it will be super interesting to understand what you know, makes uh, the difference in, um, in, uh, in results. Then uh, Yuri Gorodnichenko will, uh, will take over um, in 45 minutes, more or less, um, drawing on much of his very influential work uh, on a number of things that are very close to um, central banks. Uh, no, particularly has drawn attention on the inattention of uh, of the public to whatever central banks have to do and uh, and to uh, to to speak, um, but he will also speak about fiscal policy. How fiscal policy uh, influences uh, the the public's behavior uh, and uh, in uh, and on uh, on inflation expectations. How inflation expectations shape uh, firms' uh, behavior, in particular as price setters and uh, and employers. So very important questions, and uh, will uh, will be um, there will be a lot of interest in the answers that these two leading economists are, are going to offer. Jordi, I'm gonna give you the floor uh, in 30 minutes. You have 35, uh, sorry, 30 30 seconds. You have 35 minutes for for your exposition. Then 10 minutes we reserve for questions. Uh, please put your questions in the chat function so that I can number up them and convey them to the to the presenters. Jordi, please uh, start. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and also for uh, your introduction. So, um, yes, the title of the, um, this paper is Monetary Policy and Endogenous Financial Crisis, and this is uh, joint work with uh, Frédéric Boisset, uh, Fabrice Collard, and Christina Manea. And Frederic and Christina work uh, respectively at the BIS and the Bundesbank, so the usual uh, disclaimer applies. And let me say that this is very much um, work in progress, so uh, any comments and suggestions would be uh, extremely welcome. Now, the, the, this paper is motivated by a question that it's certainly in many central bankers' uh, minds which is um, what should be the role of financial stability considerations in the design of monetary policy. Now, the conventional view is that central banks uh, should focus on the, um, macro stability, that is, they should focus on stabilizing the output, some measure of the output gap and inflation. But there is an alternative view, especially since the great financial crisis, which holds that uh, central banks should also care about uh, preempting, uh, trying to preempt financial crisis and, of course, uh, limit their damage uh, ex post. Now, the problem uh, when it comes to trying to address this question is that the standard model of monetary policy analysis ignores financial factors, so it has little to say about financial uh, crisis. Now, of course, we know 
um, there are plenty of um, extensions by now of that model that incorporate financial frictions in the picture. However, um, in many of those extensions, most of those extensions, uh, crises are triggered by exogenous financial shocks and or the presence of financial frictions uh, just amplifies uh, the effects of non-financial shocks. Okay, of course, that's, uh, you know, that, um, that makes it possible to, to, to do some interesting analysis. However, those models uh, offer no room for monetary policy to preempt financial crisis and hence cannot even answer to the question that I raised at the beginning. Okay, so what we need is a model that has an endogenous, or that at least uh, allows for the possibility of endogenous financial crisis. And this is what we try to offer in this paper. Uh, so we develop a simple model. Uh, it's a version of the New Keynesian model with a particular type of financial frictions that uh, uh, may, um, allows for the possibility of uh, endogenous financial crisis and in which monetary policy can influence the probability of uh, such a crisis. And there's an interesting trade-off that emerges in the model between uh, short-run macroeconomic stability on the one hand and um, medium-run financial stability uh, on the other hand, okay? So let me, uh, here I have the main findings, but before I, I, I go over the main findings, let me just list the key ingredients of the model. So the model has nominal rigidities, uh, like uh, a conventional New Keynesian model, and those nominal rigidities uh, imply non-neutrality of monetary policy. Now, in contrast with the basic New Keynesian model, uh, we allow for endogenous capital accumulation. This is key in, in, the, in you know, shaping the channels to which uh, uh, a financial crisis emerges. Now, uh, you can think of the model as uh, being part of this new wave of um, monetary models with he um, heterogeneous agents in the sense that firms uh, rather than households will be subject to, to idiosyncratic shocks, uh, idiosyncratic productivity shocks in particular. And uh, the, the, the existence of those shocks um, um, makes it desirable in principle uh, for financial markets to uh, play a role in reallocating capital across uh, firms, okay? But those financial markets will be subject to um, two frictions, uh, asymmetric information and imperfect enforcement of uh, loan contracts, and imperfect uh, limited commitment by um, the part of borrowers. And uh, as we will see, this will give rise to the possibility of an endogenous uh, collapse of financial markets. Okay, so here, let me go over the main findings of the, of the paper. Okay so that you have them in mind while I, I describe the, some, some of uh, the ingredients of the model. So the approximate cause of a financial crisis in our model is the fact that returns on investment um, may become too low as a result of a capital overhang at, after a protracted boom. Okay, so uh, capital may be accumulated excessively um, and uh, that the lower returns on investment implied by that uh, will raise borrowers' incentives to channel financial resources to non-productive activities and to default, okay? The anticipation that, uh, that this may happen um, will tighten uh, what effectively is an incentive compatibility constraint, which takes the form of a maximum leverage ratio, and this uh, may lead to the collapse of loan markets and hence to a misallocation of capital in the economy and uh, uh, a decline in aggregate productivity, which will, uh, will uh, lower output considerably. Now, in this environment, deviations from price stability may be desirable uh, in the run-up to a potential crisis, okay? The reason is that by tightening monetary policy, the central bank may tame uh, booms that may bring about excessive capital accumulation. Okay, yeah, at a level of capital that cannot that may become unsustainable if um, if fundamentals uh, you know turn direction. Now, a policy that is rule based, okay, as opposed to discretionary. 
and that stresses output stability can help um, uh, avert those crises. Can at least it can reduce the probability or the incidence of those crises. And this is in contrast, as I said, with exposed discretionary interventions, which uh, may in instead enhance uh, instability. Okay. So um, let me not say much uh, about the literature because I, I have limited time. Let me just say that this is um, uh, part of a few papers in the literature that um, develop micro-founded models of endogenous financial crises. But um, um, the difference between our paper and those papers, and you can see some of those uh, listed here, is lies in the particular channel um, uh, through which, or the mechanism through which the, the, the financial crisis emerges and the implications for monetary policy. Okay. So let me just um, point out the, some of the differential ingredients relative to a basic New Keynesian model that I'm sure uh, most of the audience is, is familiar with. So, well, as in the basic uh, NK model, we have a, an infinitely lived representative consumer that maximizes preferences given by this uh, utility function, which is completely standard, sees a bundle of consumption uh, goods and is hours of work and subject to a sequence of um, budget constraints. Like here, the, the, in addition to consumption expenditures and investments in, in the nominally riskless bond, um, households can um, purchase um, shares in intermediate goods firms okay, at the real price QT. Okay, and, and, and ST is the quantity of shares, and J denotes is an index for the different uh, intermediate goods firms. And those, um, that investment in the following period will yield some dividend, okay? And so the return on investment is given by this, okay? These firms, these intermediate goods firms that um, households can, uh, on, on whose equity households can in, in invest, um, uh, are live for one period, okay? So the, 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 there are no capital gains, if you will, okay? This is the, this, the return is given just by the dividend in the in the following period after they are born. Okay, so this problem gives rise to a, a number of uh, optimality conditions, which I'll, I will not uh, go over now. Let me just say that this uh, ZT in the in in, in this Euler equation uh, is one of our exogenous um, shocks and can be interpreted as a risk premium shock. Okay? So this is similar to the risk premium shock, say in, in Smets and Powders. Okay, now. Uh, uh, on the supply side, we have um, uh, a continuum of um, final goods firms that are monopolistic competitors uh, and infinitely lift, and those firms transform an intermediate good into a differentiated final good. Okay, and they are sub, uh, they set prices uh, of their differentiated good subject to quadratic adjustment costs. Okay, so they maximize an objective function like this. So this is a dynamic. Uh, problem because of the quadratic adjustment costs, and and this gives rise to an optimality condition, which in a symmetric equilibrium um, takes the form of a new Keynesian, what effectively is a new Keynesian Phillips curve. Okay, capital pi t here is gross inflation, and this gross inflation uh, depends um, dynamically on the gap between the uh, average markup in the economy M t, and the average markup is given by the price. Of, um, of final goods over the price of the intermediate good, okay, times one minus tau, tau is just a subsidy that we introduced for technical reasons, okay. The gap between this actual markup that I just mentioned and the desired markup, which is given by the usual uh, function of the price elasticity of uh, Okay, so um, this is pre pretty much a standard. Now let me turn to our, um, where um, much of the action is. Uh, which is in the intermediate goods firms. Okay, so we have again a continuum um, of, um, of intermediate goods firms, but now th those firms produce an identical good and they are perfectly competitive. So they take the price of that good uh, as given. Okay, the price of that good is the little pt, which was an input, which was the price of the input of the final goods firms. Now, they live for one period, they are exactly identical. But they are subject uh, to idiosyncratic and aggregate productivity shocks exposed. Okay, so in particular, for a firm that um, draws an idiosyncratic shock Q, this is the 
production function. Okay, so this is the output and capital and labor that the firm will employ. And this you see here, Q is the is the is the shock. And for and in addition to this idiosyncratic shock, we have an, ag an aggregate technology shock that follows an AR1 process. And so on. now for simplicity, um, um, we assume that Q can take just two values, one or zero. If Q takes a value equal to one, the firm is productive. If the Q equals zero, the firm is unproductive. Okay, and there is a mass mu, constant mass mu of firms that are unproductive each period. Now, at the end of period t minus one, um, so, now think of a firm now, an intermediate goods firm that will operate in period t. Okay, now in, at the end of period t minus one, the firm is born, if you will, and issues equity in order to uh, finance uh, its capital. Okay. Now, each firm, all terms are exactly identical, so they will get the same amount of equity, okay, which will be QT minus one. Okay, we normalize the, the number of shares per firm to be equal to one. Now, we, at the beginning of period T, shocks are observed, okay, demand shocks and the technology shocks, okay. And then each firm determines its optimal level of capital and its optimal level of employment on the basis of those aggregate shocks and the um, idiosyncratic shock Q. Now, the gap between the desired capital and the initial equity funding is, uh, will, is financed through the loan market. Okay? There will be a loan market, um, and the firms, in principle, can borrow and lend in that market at a real interest rate, RT. Okay? Now, during T, or at the end of T, if you want, they will produce and sell their intermediate good at a price PT, which they take as given, and they will sell the undepreciated capital, one minus delta KTQ, at the price PT at the end of the period, and then they will distribute all the proceeds to the uh, shareholders. Okay, that's the dividend that entered the budget constraint. Very good. Now, we, one could uh, compute, determine what's the equity return for a firm with productivity Q, okay, and it just, again, as I said earlier, it's the dividend divided by the initial equity injection. Here is an expression for the dividend, which is includes revenues minus labor costs, minus financial costs of, you know, borrowing the capital gap, okay? Plus um, the proceeds from selling the undepreciated capital. Now in equilibrium, uh, it can be shown that um, the equity injection has to be equal to KT. So we can replace QT minus one here by KT and we can write down this return on equity in terms of KT and um, other variables uh, that the firm chooses, okay? Very good. Now, monetary policy is just given by a Taylor type rule, okay? So the nominal rate responds to inflation and to deviations of output from steady state according to this rule, okay? So the central bank will choose these two parameters, phi pi and phi y. Very good. Now, let me start by describing the, fric the frictionless benchmark. So um, here, all potential lenders observe Q and contracts are fully enforceable, okay? And rather than going through the, um, okay, the, the, you know, this algebra, let me just show you some, the, the, the implied uh, aggregate su uh, um, loan supply, aggregate loan supply and aggregate loan demand functions because I, they are quite, uh, they are quite intuitive. Okay, so this is the loan supply, this is the loan market, okay, this is the interest rate on loans, okay, and let's look at the loan supply, that's the, given by the blue line, so the, if the interest rate on loans is less than minus the depreciation rate, okay, it doesn't pay even for unproductive firms to lend their capital uh, in the loan market, okay, so they, they're the supply, they, 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 instead they may want to uh, borrow as much as possible, keep the capital idle and resell it at the end of the period. Okay, so the supply of loans will be zero. Now, if the interest rate in the loan market equals minus the depreciation rate, then th those firms are indifferent between keeping the capital idle or uh, lending it out in the loan market. So we have this uh, horizontal line here and this is given by the, you know, up to this point, this is KT, okay, the, the initial capital that the, all firms have times mu, which is the uh, mass fraction of unproductive firms, okay? So 
uh, for any interest rate in the loan market above that, uh, um, unproductive firms will be willing to supply all their capital on the loan market. Now, if the interest rate is below, is above, sorry, this threshold that you see here, or this threshold, this threshold is just the, the what we could call the net operating return on investment on, by productive firms, okay? So if the interest rate is above this threshold, and this includes, you know, this, this uh, object here is just the um, output capital ratio. So the, the numerator is the marginal product of capital. This is the, the average markup in the economy. And this, the, the whole expression, again, as I said, it's, it's the net return on investment. So if the interest rate is above this threshold, then even productive firms will not to put their capital into work and they will instead supply it on the loan market. And that's uh, this additional uh, uh, segment of the, of the loan supply. And this is loan demand. The loan demand is straightforward. So if the interest rate um, in the loan market is above uh, the return on investment, then uh, no one will want to borrow uh, in the loan market in order to increase their capital. If it's equal to the net return on investment, then we will have this indifference, okay? And if it's below the, you know, um, the, the, the demand for loans will be infinite, okay? Now, if we combine the loan supply and the loan demand, and we examine and we look for the uh, competitive equilibrium in this loan market, we see that there's only one, one equilibrium, okay, which is given by this point E, in which, um, uh, you know, uh, all unproductive firms supply their capital, which they don't really need or want, in the, uh, to, to in the, in the loan market, and um, uh, productive firms uh, borrow uh, in the loan market in order to increase their capital um, and, and the interest rate in equilibrium in the loan market is given to the return on, on investment. Okay, so we have, again, we're looking at the frictionless benchmark still in equilibrium, the interest rate in the loan market will be equal to the return uh, that uh, unproductive firms uh, get from investing in, 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 in the loan, from lending out their capital in the loan market and will be equal to the return of productive firms and, uh, and it will be equal in turn to, to the, to the um, return on investment, okay? Now, uh, output in equilibrium then will be given since all capital has been reallocated, so to speak, to productive firms will be given by this production function and the equilibrium can be shown to be equivalent to that of a standard New Keynesian model with a representative form. Okay, so nothing particularly interesting happens. Now let's uh, look at the case of uh, frictions, in the same model. So now we are going to assume there is a symmetric information. So uh, um, firms only, on, um, no, no potential lenders can observe the productivity of a firm and there's limited enforceability of loan cont contracts. Borrowers can just run away with the, uh, the money. Okay, if they find it is uh, optimal to do so. So now let's think about the options that an unproductive firm has in that context. It can borrow to increase its capital. Okay, it is an unproductive firm. Huh? It can borrow to increase its capital, keep it idle, and sell it at the end of the period and run away with the, with the money, abscond. Okay, now what's the implied payoff in that case? Remember, the firm is unproductive, so it will not really produce or sell. So what it will do is just to sell the undepreciated capital that uh, it borrows, and it will borrow as much as a productive firm would want to borrow. That is, it will pretend to be a productive firm, okay, when it um, shows, up, shows up at the loan market. Alternatively, uh, it can lend out its capital in the loan market, in which case the implied payoff depends on its initial capital KT times one plus the interest rate in the loan market, okay? Obviously, um, we want to avoid and the, the possibility that the firm finds it incentive to run away with uh, borrow to borrow and run away with the money. So that requires that the payoffs uh, have that the, the, the second payoff is no uh, lower, is no smaller than the first payoff, and that implies a maximum leverage ratio, which is given given by this. Okay, so notice that the lower is the return on the loan market the uh, lower will be the maximum leverage ratio because in that case, uh, the lower is the return on the loan market, the higher is the incentive for an unproductive firm 
to pretend to be productive, borrowing the loan, mar loan market uh, as much as it can, and, and, and run away with the money. Very good. So that gives rise to um, an, uh, an, ag an aggregate demand for loans. Now, the aggregate supply for loans will take the same form as before. That hasn't changed, but now the aggregate demand for loans is given by this, right? It, will, it bang, bends backwards, if you will, okay? And the reason is that for interest rates below uh, the, um, the return on, on investment, okay, the, the incentive compatibility constraint is binding, okay? And, uh, and it takes this form, as, as I mentioned earlier, the lower is the, the, lower is the return, the interest rate on loans, the tighter is the is the maximum leverage ratio, and the uh, smaller is the amount of funds that um, that uh, productive firms can borrow. Okay, and productive firms now will not want to borrow because again, because of incentive compatibility constraint. Okay, so now there are two possible cases. Suppose that the return on investment is high. Okay, and by high, what we mean is that this condition is satisfied. Okay, so that depends, among other things, on the markup, and it depends on the marginal product of capital. So suppose that the stock of capital, if you want, is not too, is not too large. Okay, so the return on investment is still high. In that case, um, we will have uh, uh, the, the, the equilibrium of the whole market can be represented by a diagram like this, and we will have three, three possible equilibria, and um, there, there, there will always be an equilibrium without trade. Okay, this is the autarkic equilibrium in which no one borrows or lends. Then there is an equilibrium which is unstable and which we are going to ignore. And instead, we will focus on this equilibrium, which corresponds to the efficient uh, equilibrium allocation. And it's the equilibrium that we would observe in, if markets uh, were frictionless, and in which all the capital uh, uh, that um, firms, unproductive firms has is reallocated to productive firms. Okay, So that's the case where you know, this term, uh, the return uh, to investment is sufficiently high. But what happens if the, if maybe because there has been excessive capital accumulation, the return on investment or new investment is low, okay? Then, um, uh, by the way, in the previous case, if there will be a, a, a corresponds to what we call normal times. And again, since all the capital is reallocated to, to productive firms, again, we're back to the case of is equivalent to a case of a representative. Uh, now, suppose that the return on investment is low, now, below, below this threshold. Then we will have a situation like this, in which uh, you know the demand for loans and the supply for loans don't intersect, except for this point. Okay, and again, the the the, the reason is that the return to investment is um, is so low. Uh, that um, the interest rates that in the loan market that productive firms uh, can pay are um, also low and are too low. And, and, and the fact that they are low implies a very tight um, uh, maximum leverage ratio and uh, demand for loans that for any interest rate on loans is uh, always less than the supply for loans. Okay, so the only possible equilibrium here, so if you want, there will be an, always an excess supply for loans that will put downward pressure on the interest rate, and it will drive the economy to this equilibrium in which there is no, no, no trade, and in which, uh, you know, that's what we call a financial crisis, and in which uh, aggregate output is now reduced by this, by this uh, wedge here, one minus mean, okay, because, uh, um, the capital of productive fir um, productive firms will not be reallocated to productive firms. Very good. So now let me examine uh, the, and briefly uh, comment the, the condition under which a crisis will emerge, and then I will just uh, I'll show you the anatomy of a typical crisis based on some numerical simulations. Okay. So this is the condition under which um, um, the only equilibrium will be the equilibrium uh, without. Uh, with a, um, with a collapsed uh, loan market, okay? So, again, this is the aggregate marginal product of capital, if you want. Uh, this, is the, um, this is the average markup, 
Okay, so you can see that given KT, given the capital stock, which is predetermined, okay, a crisis can be induced by a lower Y, lower aggregate output, or a higher uh, and or a higher average markup. Okay, so typically, if say a negative demand shock will we can bring about a, a crisis by increasing the markup or reducing output. Okay, now in that case, the okay, monetary policy should seek to stabilize both in the short run. Okay, so that's the usual, the conventional approach to monetary policy that would say, look, in response to demand shocks, it stabilizes output, it stabilizes the markup. Okay, but notice that this condition may also hold, and the crisis may emerge if the capital is too high. Okay, but of course the capital accumulates over time gradually. Okay, so uh, and in that case, the larger is the capital, the smaller will be the shock demand shock or a technology shock, whatever, that may trigger the crisis. So what can what can monetary policy do in that case? Well, it should prevent the capital from accumulating excessively because otherwise the, pro, the, the financial fragility of the economy will increase because the, the, a smaller shock will trigger a collapse of financial markets. Okay, but of course, this is a process that takes place in the medium. It's not in, not in the short run. In addition, there are some feedback effects because anticipation of a possible crisis raises precautionary savings by households, and that increases capital accumulation and hence the probability of a future crisis. Okay, so the reason, an additional reason why um, the central bank may want to preempt that excessive capital accumulation. So now let me show you a picture that um, kind of um, um, describes uh, the, the, what is a typical financial crisis in this economy. Okay, so we calibrate the model in a standard way. All the parameters are standard. We assume a standard Taylor rule as a baseline with a fraction of unproductive firms being this, which is relatively small, 2.4%, which implies a crisis incidence of 8%. That's the only non-standard parameter. We simulate the nonlinear um, model over 1 million, to 1 million periods using a global solution method. We identify um, the crisis and the starting dates of crisis, and then we we record the values of a different of the shocks and the variables around those um, crisis starting dates, and we report the average values okay, around the simulated uh, crisis. And here you have the you have the those average values around starting dates of crisis simulated in the in our simulation. Okay, so zero. Is the starting date of a crisis, and here you have, for instance, the values of the supply shock around, you know, quarters around that starting date. The values of the demand shock, capital stock, and so on. Okay, so you can see that in the typical crisis, oh by the way, and the horizontal line gives the steady state values for all the variables. The typical crisis is one that because of positive supply shocks and positive demand shocks, but especially positive supply shocks. Okay. That leads to a, a, a large accumulation of capital, well above the steady state. Okay, and what happens is that those supply shocks just go away, and that's the same for the demand shocks. Okay, so this high capital becomes unsustainable, and but then a small shock, technology or demand, triggers a crisis, and that's what we see here. And after the crisis, you know, the capital stock will be will decline, but only uh, gradually. And then you can see that during the crisis, there was a, a, a significant uh, a decline in output, okay? and also quite, quite persistent. Okay? So um, what should the monetary policy do? Here we were assuming a standard table, okay? usual calibration. Okay? Um, so what, what are the options for monetary policy? Now, in the absence of financial frictions, the optimal monetary policy is straightforward in this model because the only the only imperfection or distortion we have is the existence of sticky prices. So the optimal policy is a strict inflation targeting. Okay? However, with financial frictions, um, this is not optimal because what the strict inflation targeting does is to replicate the flexible price equilibrium allocation. And this is not efficient because they may involve you know, too many inefficient crises. And the inefficiency of those crises is the result of individual agents do not internalizing the consequences of their decisions on financial fragility, of course, like in many models. 
Now, a strict inflation targeting in that context fully ne neutralizes demand shocks, okay, so that's good, so because it will eliminate demand-driven crisis, but it amplifies output and capital fluctuations driven by technology shocks, okay? And that will be a sort could be potentially a source of crisis because uh, of the excess capital accumulation that uh, they may generate. So, what may be more desirable um, output uh, policies that aim at stabilizing output? And then, so let me show you a table. Okay, I don't know how much time I have, uh, Massimo. Maybe you can give me a tip about that. I, I don't hear you. Sorry. Uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, so let me show you this table and then I will just conclude. Okay, so here we have, um, you know, think of uh, the, the model with um, without financial frictions. Okay, here you have different values of the uh, coefficient on inflation and the coefficient on output. We know that in that model, you know, the optimal, optimal policy is given by strict inflation targeting and any policy that deviates from that will generate some some losses. So these are the consu uh, consumption equivalent um, uh, losses, permanent consumption equivalent losses. Okay, and in particular, you can see, as is well known, and because some of the fluctuations are driven by technology shocks, uh, the larger is the coefficient on output, the larger are the welfare losses. Okay, so in that we know that the, you know in that model without financial frictions, it is optimal for the for the central bank to single-mindedly uh, 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 stabilize inflation because that will also stabilize the output gap, okay, which is what is optimal as opposed to stabilizing output. But now let's consider the case of frictional loan markets, and you see here what happens as we um, increase, uh, as, as you know, starting from the strict inflation targeting, we adopt the standard Taylor rule, and or alternatively we keep increasing the coefficient on output. You can see that. The welfare losses become welfare gains relative to strict inflation targeting. Okay, and the main reason is given by this column. Here you see the incidence of financial crisis under each rule, and you can see that as the coefficient on output is increased, okay, the incidence of financial crisis uh, uh, gets uh, reduced. Okay, and obviously that's desirable because those financial crises lead to a misallocation of capital and inefficient output uh, losses. Okay. So um, let me skip this um, part. Well, we have just to, to we, we show that we introduced uh, in the last part of the paper, we introduced monetary policy shocks and we show that an additional reason why um, a financial crisis may emerge is because of, of um, a monetary policy that is too loose, okay? By the, the, as a result of a sequence of um, shocks that uh, are on average, uh, imply on average interest rates that are uh, below the interest rate implied by the Taylor rule, uh, but also, and interestingly, okay, uh, the crisis may be triggered uh, at the end of the, at the end of the run-up period if the, there is a positive monetary policy shock. Okay, so we interpret this as a, as a warning against uh, the temptation by the central bank uh, when it's late in the crisis and capital has accumulated excessively to uh, increase the interest rate. Okay, because then it's too late, it will not have any impact on, on capital accumulation anymore, and instead uh, the economy is sufficiently fragile that it may trigger a financial crisis itself, as, as, as we see in this case. Okay, so let me just uh, conclude. So we've shown a, a simple extension of the basic Duquesne model with financial frictions and endogenous financial crisis. We focus, and this is important, our model focuses on, on one dimension of financial crisis. It's not meant to be a comprehensive model of financial crisis, uh, in particular on the misallocation and loss in productivity resulting from financial markets not doing their work. Okay, and um, there, are, we have, uh, there are many papers that provide evidence of, of such a misallocation taking, taking place during the, in particular during the most recent financial crisis. And the lessons for monetary policy is that there may be a rationale for deviating from price stability as a single focus and uh, in order to avert financial fragility. Thank you for your attention.